Hello, and welcome to the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. I'm Fred Burton with the Ontic Center for Connected Intelligence. During my years as a counterterrorism agent with the U.S. State Department and time spent as a physical security expert in the private sector, I've seen it all and met many fascinating people along the way. This podcast series explores the riveting world of safety, security, and protection through conversations with leaders in the field. I'm Fred Burton, and now on to the podcast. Hi, I'm Fred Burton, here today with Tim Kirkham. Tim is the Senior Director and serves as Global Head of Security, Investigations, and Insider Risk Management at Dell Technologies. Tim leads Dell's Global Security Investigation Strategy to protect Dell and affiliated non-public subsidiaries, pursuing over 6,000 investigations annually in the areas of fraud, insider threats, workplace violence, harassment, theft, privacy, economic espionage, and data protection. Tim also developed and is responsible for Dell's Insider Risk Management Program, designed to protect Dell's people, property, and competitive advantage to include trade secrets, intellectual property, and confidential information. In the public sector, Tim served over 29 years as a law enforcement officer, including 20 years as a special agent in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Tim, welcome to the Ontic Connected Intelligence Podcast. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate you having me today. Really looking forward to this one, Tim. Tell us a little bit about your background as an FBI agent. Sure. Uh, I actually started as a, a local police officer and and uh, worked in the patrol car and as a canine officer for about nine years and and then eventually went to the FBI. Uh, my first office there was in the Phoenix Division. And what was a little bit unique about that was it was a one man resident agency up in northwest Arizona. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up, I it, it kind of these like steps through life that prepare you for what ultimately for me became these corporate positions that I've held. And, and that was one of them, right? In that one man office in the FBI, I really had to collaborate well with state, local, county agencies, other federal agencies in the 5,000 square mile area that I was solely responsible for, for the FBI. Uh, really interesting time. It was after the, the bombing in Oklahoma City. Uh, oh, yeah. Lots and lots of work being done in that area on that case. And it's a great learning experience for me in, in many, many different ways. Um, after 9-11, I became a JTTF supervisor and eventually uh, was accepted into our legal attache program, which you of all people from your time in DS are familiar with the legal attache program. Sure. Uh, many people think those are lawyers, but really it's it's a diplomatic title assigned to the lead FBI person in a particular U.S. embassy around the world. And, and I did multiple tours. Um, I did. I was the legal attache in Jordan with responsibility for Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. From there, I went to the UAE. So I was in the UAE and Oman, from there to Yemen and there to Tunisia. So quite a bit of time in the Middle East. And again, I felt like this was, you know, didn't know it at the time, but this was great preparation for the adaptation later to the corporate world, to the corporate culture. Because as you know, you know Fred, in the, in the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. Embassy has multiple missions that it's accomplishing overseas and law enforcement uh, being just one of many. So it's not like in the United States where you're uh, this big, powerful agency and you can demand people do things, <laughs> right, <laughs> whatever right. terminology we want to use, but you really have to learn how to get along in the embassy and, and who your stakeholders are, the, the regional security officer, the, the chief of station, the deputy chief of missions, the political section, all of those stakeholders that you identify early on that you can provide value to, and then they in turn can help you accomplish your mission was a great preparatory ground for the corporate environment. Yeah, amazing. And uh, of course, um, the FBI legal attache program uh, has just grown leaps and bounds in, in uh, the times that I was associated with the program as well. Looking back, Tim, I got to ask you, where was your favorite overseas assignment? 
who I would I I would have to just go back to Jordan, right? It was it was my first one. It's a just a wonderful place with great people. Um, family was there with me, and you know we learned a lot together, and and really learned to love the country and love the people. Uh, I still to this day we we talk about it and look back at it very fondly. Absolutely. Now, uh, after your time as a cop and a FBI agent and FBI supervisor, how did you transition to the corporate world? Did you retire from the bureau? Well, I, I did. I actually was recruited into a role before I retired. And, and to be honest with you, I, I hadn't even considered retiring yet. I was just coming up on my 20. Um, I didn't do a lot of pre-planning for what's my post-retirement career going to be. But And you might, you might be able to echo this. I, I just don't think back then that we did, right? The right. federal service was a lifelong endeavor. And I didn't think much about retirement jobs. I certainly thought about my pension and how it might support us, but not what I wanted to do. And and then I started at this time period, I got a couple of calls. I got um, one from a former uh, supervisor of mine who was in a Fortune 100 company that was interested in starting an insider threat program. And the other one was from a company uh, where my current assignment was another Fortune 100 company that was looking for a counterintelligence supervisor. So I decided to interview for both of those jobs and as as luck would have it received offers from both places at the same time and and I ended up selecting the one to build the insider threat program it was kind of a cool title it was trade secrets protection manager sure. um and part of the, the interesting part of that is when i was recruited in that job i i said i you know i don't really i guess understand corporate insider threat and his response was yeah i don't really care we'll we can teach you all that you can learn all that he said what i really need is someone with the communication skills to help all of the stakeholders and even the C-suite understand why we need to have such a program. And at the time, I don't know that it it really resonated with me like it does now, but that is a critical, critical asset for someone to have that's going to try to build new programs in corporations the size of, of the ones that I've worked in. Yeah, that was very uh, sage advice at the time. If you think about starting any kind of program up uh, inside of a a corporation, and how do you feel your background at the bureau helped you successfully build corporate investigation programs? Sure, I, I think we talked a little bit about it already, right? So some of the assignments that I had, coincidentally really helped prepare me for that leap to corporate culture. And and people talk about that a lot. And I think when I first started hearing about the leap from government to corporate culture, I looked at it with a little bit of a questioning eye. Like, is this a real thing? Or is this just what people that are already in the corporate world say because they don't want government employees coming to work here, right? And, right. and, not, and just not knowing. And, and I know now after, you know, going on my 10th year in the corporate world, that it is a real thing. And there are those who struggle with the transition. I think I was lucky enough to have had this just continuing series of positions that positioned me really well to adapt to the corporate culture, or if you will, like the consensus culture that exists in the corporate world. I mean, where I see people really having trouble with the transition is not having that, look, just use a specific example. In the corporate world, it took me a while to figure out there's no one single approving authority that's going to sign off on one of my ideas or one of my programs or one of my processes and say, yes, this is it. This is approved. Tim Kirkham has approval for this. Now everybody go do it. That doesn't exist, right? right. In the corporate world. And, and you instead, you have to identify all your key stakeholders and you have to involve them in the process that you're trying to build and gain their consensus that, yes, in fact, this is a good idea and this is something that we should do. And then that becomes the equivalent of that single sign off authority that you've been searching for. In the absence of doing that, if you just run your programs and say, well, you know, chief security officer told me I need to do this, 
you're, you're going to stumble in the corporate world. You're going to have people who say, mm, nobody asked me and I don't support this. And you're going to find yourself back at square one. So, so I really think that that's one of the areas people struggle with. And, and the other is just, you know, not having authority when you're a federal agent, you spend your life with a set of credentials or a badge in your pocket that allows you to compel certain things to be done as long as you're following, you know, the, the rules of whatever legal framework you operate in. And you don't have that in the corporate world as security um, professionals, we're a cost center that serves the business. So we really have to understand that. And we have to understand that in order to be successful in corporate security, we have to not only serve the business and serve them well, but to gain their support because we've helped them to understand that we can add value to them and to the business. Even though we don't sell anything and we don't build anything, we still add value. Tim, uh, when you think about uh, what you've been so successful in doing in the insider threat arena, what lessons have you learned in building an insider threat program that you could share with our audience? Yeah, I think the number one for me, and, and I've thought back on this a lot I, over the last few years, especially I've, I've presented at some workshops and, and, and done some lectures for CSOs and, and for other corporate security professionals that were trying to just kind of rein in or get their arms around this whole insider threat program idea because it, it can be very complex and it differs from one company culture to the next. So the, the one thing that I keep resolving back to and the one piece of advice I give everybody is try not to start too big. If you, if you come in to your leadership with this, you know, massive three-year plan that involves headcount and technology purchases and millions of dollars in budgeting, you're really setting yourself up for failure because it takes a little bit of time in an insider risk program to show value. And the ability to show that value is what keeps your funding coming, right? And, and like I said, we're a cost center. So if you start small, my recommendation always is start small, use the existing technology that your company already has. Everybody's got a cybersecurity team. Everybody's got tools on the network. These tools have logs, whether they're data loss prevention tools or otherwise, they're, they're there and they exist. And they can be leveraged to put together a pretty good insider risk program, especially when you couple that with your HR teams, your human resources teams, your annual training, uh, your employee awareness. There's probably already an investigations team, whether that be in in your security department, whether it's in your human resources, whether it's in legal, but bringing all those people together early on and putting your program together at almost a zero budget, right? A, a very low budget at a minimum insider risk program where you can focus on specific high risk areas that will allow you to show the benefit of the program that you're building. And then once you go through that first year or 18 months or two years, depending on the size and nature of your company, you can start putting together those value added metrics, those return on invest in investment metrics that give you the support that you need. And eventually your program will become a part of your company's culture and it will help you build out that risk aware culture that's going to allow you to make effective business cases for the improvements that you want to make annually or the maturation steps that you want to take that might involve budget or headcount. Yeah, that's very good advice. I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. We'll get back to the conversation in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ontix Center for Connected Intelligence. In the world of safety, security, and protection, we know that gathering and sharing information is crucial. That is why we created the Ontix Center for Connected Intelligence. The center is a hub for the ongoing exchange of security strategies and best practices, insights on current and past trends, and sharing valuable information through expert discussion and analysis. It's made up of seasoned experts across a wide range of disciplines. 
To find blogs, podcasts, webinars, white papers, and more, check out the center by visiting ontic.co slash center. That's ontic.co slash center. Tim, you've got your finger on the pulse uh, as you look at this space. And so I got to ask you, what are what are some of the most overlooked vulnerabilities in today's threat landscape when it comes to insider threats? Yeah, I think for me, that has been and in large part continues to be the risk posed by offboarding employees. And, and the reason I say this is because we at the company I'm at now, my previous company, and I know everybody listening, your company's go to great lengths to hire good people. We do background checks. We do multiple interviews. Um, everything is designed to bring in people who fit your company culture and who are good people that are going to help the company be successful. And I'm a true believer in that. But I also know firsthand from 30 years of doing this, 30 plus years, that even the best people make bad decisions under stress. And when an employee offboards from a company, whether it be a workforce reduction, maybe they're resigning to a competitor, maybe they're going making that leap from director to vice president that they wouldn't have been able to make in their own company. But when that happens, even just retirement, you're retiring and going on a fixed income, it's very stressful. When people offboard from a company, it's very stressful. Let's say you're getting promoted, they're resigned to competitor option. Um, imposter syndrome sinks in. And I think most people know what that is, right? You start to doubt yourself. Can I really do what this company's hiring me to do? And it just causes people to make that mistake that they wouldn't have made in a less stressful moment. And you know, maybe they're taking items with them that they think they might need to be successful. Uh, maybe it's a workforce reduction and maybe they're upset. They're stressed. The stress is more than they can handle and they're upset with the company, but people make bad decisions. And it's important upon us as an insider risk team to help them make good decisions on their way out the door. And, and the reason this risk is underestimated, I think, is because these are good employees. They've always been in good employees and everybody will be, oh, well, this employee's always been a good person and they won't do anything. We don't have to worry about it. If we pre-notified them that their job's going to be cut because they're a good person. They wouldn't do anything. Well, we see over and over again that that's not always true because stress drives uh, poor decision making. So I see our role as the insider threat program really and truly to help these employees leave our company with their head held just as high as the day they got there. We want their integrity in check. We want them to come back someday. If this person goes and becomes a vice president at some other company, maybe they come back here as a senior vice president and we benefit from all that experience. But they won't come back if they took something they weren't supposed to take or deleted something they shouldn't have deleted or did something out of anger on their way out the door that we could have prevented. So. Uh, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, this is this is a strategy that resonates well with HR because they want the same thing. Sure. They want to retain talent or they want talent to come back. And when you shape your your risk like that and help everybody understand that they were not out to, to get people, we're not looking to punish people. We just really want to protect our company. We want to protect our competitive advantage. And ultimately, we want to protect our employees, whether they're coming or going and you know that's that's part of our interview strategy it's you know when you approach an employee who's leaving and you've gotten multiple alerts and they've got some things they shouldn't have taken because they think it might help them further down the road just simply telling them that hey you know don't don't feel bad about this we do this all the time but we want you to leave here with your integrity intact. We don't want anyone to be able to question, hey, employee, so-and-so took something they shouldn't have when they left. We're gonna help you put all this back in the box, get it where it belongs, and then we're gonna write a report verifying that you cooperated and you helped us and and you left here uh, in great standing. And it's a, it's a winning interview strategy. 
Tim, how have you seen running insider threat investigations evolve over time? Yeah, I I guess the, the biggest thing that I've seen is is just the changing in, in technology. And the, the changes in technology have allowed us to move quicker uh, and more effectively and know more than we used to know. And, and I'm talking about things like UEBA tools, um, I'm ta- user behavior analytics. I'm talking about um, the improvements in data loss prevention technologies. And then in addition to that, I've, I've just seen great progress in what we're able to do with employee awareness and education. So in order for us to really focus on serious incidents and devote the resources that we have to the things that could impact the company the most, we really had to work to eliminate not only false positives, but things that were being done by people who were just working hard, trying to find the fastest and most effective way to do their job. And in so doing, we're, we're crushing all of the good security practices. See, so, so you've got to get rid of all of those so that you can focus on the hard stuff. And, and we've found things like little three minute videos that we produce and we send out to employees under certain circumstances are super effective. And that's, that's a technology we wouldn't have had when I first started doing this, but you know, based upon a certain trigger, employee gets a three-minute video. Who doesn't have time to watch a three-minute video? If sure. People aren't, don't want to watch a 20-minute video, but they'll watch a three-minute video. And that three-minute video not only helps educate that employee about the risk and helps put modify their behavior, put it where you want it to be, but they'll tell somebody else who will tell somebody else. And eventually that allows us to start eliminating all of the um, the noise, if you will, in the background so that we can really focus more effectively on the serious issues. Tim, I would be remiss for not asking you this. Uh, based on your subject matter expertise, what do you think is on the horizon for insider threats? What should our listeners be looking out for in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um and and it's it's on my mind and it's certainly something that we're working hard on now and and it's 100% how is the the growth of ai going to affect our ability to detect and respond but also how is it going to increase the threat so you know when you talk about insider risk that's one thing, but even our fraud investigations team, right? How is the use of AI by criminal groups or fraud groups going to be used against us? And how can we defend ourselves against that? Or from an insider's perspective, how could AI potentially be used to make our employees unwitting insiders? And how can we detect that? How can we educate our employees to be aware of that and alert to it? And really a lot of discussion, a lot of work on our upcoming strategies about AI. You know, can we want to use it. <laughs> Everybody's got it. We want to use it. We want to increase velocity and effectiveness of investigations. We want to increase our detection capabilities. We want to increase the accuracy of our detection. But at the same time, we know that we could easily be victimized by AI and we want to have a better understanding of what those techniques may be and how we can defend against them. Fascinating, fascinating, Tim. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to say? Uh, No, I don't, I don't think so. I I think, you know, the one thing I would encourage everybody to do is, is reach out and reach out often to, to me, to people like yourself that are doing this podcast. Um, I get emails every week from peers with other companies. I had a couple yesterday from somebody and we share information. I mean, there's no trade secrets in how we protect our companies. Uh, There's no reason to keep any of this secret. There's no reason not to share. We're all in the same boat. And I think I've learned more in the last 10 years of doing this from my peers and other companies than I could have ever learned at any course that I could have taken. I I mean, I, I, I just think we're all 
in the same situation here. We're all making mistakes every week. We're learning from those mistakes. We share the results and, and we all get better together. Tim, thank you so much for being on the Ontic Connected Intelligence Podcast. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. This episode was brought to you by the Ontic Center for Connected Intelligence. Learn more at ontic.co slash center. Again, that's ontic.co slash center. It was produced by AJ McKeon. Our music is a track called Monte Verde Ride and was written by Brian Bristow and performed by Smoke and Novus. Check them out on Spotify. Please remember to rate and review our podcast on iTunes and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions, we'd love to hear them. You can reach us at podcasts at ontic.co or visit ontic.co slash center for more information. Thanks for listening.